We're now starting the fluid mechanics section of our course and this will encompass both fluid statics and fluid dynamics. This presentation is a summary of um, some different topics we may be covering throughout this section. The first thing I want to talk about here is the no-slip condition. We may observe this in some of our analysis as this is important in pipe flows and in many other flows as well. Here we have flow over a flat plate and what you see is on the interface between our gas here, our incoming air, and the solid surface of the plate is that this incoming fluid sticks to this plate or at this interface the velocity is zero. What you'll notice though as we go up the velocity is not zero so this velocity gradient is very large. So in this area where the velocity gradient is large we call that the boundary layer. And in the boundary layer although the magnitude of the size of the boundary layer is relatively small a lot of the important elements of a flow occur in the boundary layer. So for example, a large part of the drag that's going to be occurring along this plate surface is going to be due to this boundary layer effect or this fluid kind of dragging along this surface here causes a shear stress or force acting on the surface of this plate. You may also, so we may also see, and we won't discuss it here in this class, but you may also see in practice and discuss it in your fluid mechanics class, where we see things like the separation of fluid. If the fluid has enough velocity, momentum will tend to keep carrying it over this point, and we call this point a separation point. That may tend to have some adverse effects over some flow, con flow geometries and different flow conditions. So when we're looking at things like the boundary layer, we can divide things up into several regions. And these are important and we're gonna be, they're going to be more important as we start looking at things like the energy equation and Bernoulli's equation. Here, uh, in the area where the boundary layer is found, that's called the viscous flow region. So we see a large effect of the fluid viscosity occurring in this boundary layer. Above, or in this case, this is a plate, so above and below this region here, this is called the inviscid flow region where viscosity no longer plays a dominant role. And this region here allows us to do perform a lot of analyses on some of the flow over different types of bodies and also we're able to derive a relationship for pressure and velocity that's very useful and that we'll be talking about in the following chapter. We'll also look at some a few examples of external flow and internal flows. Basically external flows is anything that's unbounded. So here you see the tennis ball is external flow. Airplane wing would be external flow. If we're looking at pipe flow, that would be considered an internal flow. So something that has a bounded walls uh, prohibiting the flow to move outward if it wanted to. So these are two different types of flows and they require two different types of analyses. You may also hear me use the term incompressible or compressible flows. This really has to do with the density of the flow. So if I say something is incompressible, that means the density is constant or is nearly constant throughout the process. Compressible flow is really applicable in very high velocity conditions usually. Compressible flow means that the density changes during the flow. Now here we have an example of a Schlieren image which is showing these different colored lines representing density gradients or density changes in this particular flow over this, this space shuttle at a very high velocity. Now you may say Mach number 3. You may have heard about Mach number and we won't talk about it much in this class. But basically 
it's a non-dimensional tool that allows us to determine how fast we are moving relative to the local speed of sound. So if we're moving at a Mach number of 1, we're moving at the speed of sound. If we're moving less than 1, we're less than the speed of sound, etc. Here, this would mean that we're moving at three times the speed of sound in this particular case. You may also hear me talk about laminar and turbulent flows. Transitional flow, we'll consider for our class as just turbulent flow. So in laminar flows, they're characterized by basically being a smooth uh, layer of fluid flow. Um, we can predict where the velocity is going to move. It follows our equations very nicely as far as uh, our, uh, allowing us to have a relatively easy analytical solution to this type of flow. Whereas turbulent flows are chaotic, random, and disordered. Uh, by nature. So there's a lot of different analyses that go with each type of these flows and these become very important in many different industrial applications and also scientific applications as well. Now there's several different types of flow. Uh, by and large we are talking mainly about force flow in the class. There's also na uh, natural fluid flow due to buoyancy and things like that, but that's mainly saved for your heat transfer course. So we're usually talking about flow that is forced. Um, so if we, we're going to be dealing with a lot with maybe pumps, fans, different types of devices that help us to move fluid flow. And that's really what we're going to be talking about for the most part. Another term we'll be using as we talk about fluid mechanics is steady or unsteady and we'll pr particularly use this when we're talking about the conservation of momentum and we've already introduced this a little bit when we talked about conservation of mass the difference between these is that steady means that it doesn't change with time whereas unsteady is just the opposite of that as you can imagine though for our analyses, since turbines, compressors, boilers, condensers, heat exchangers, many different real world applications are steady flow devices, we will also focus on steady flow analysis for a majority of our uh, problem solving sessions. This is a pretty cool uh, image here showing two different ways you can analyze something, okay? So this is showing a uh, airfoil or a certain airfoil moving at a high velocity or velocity of Mach number 0.6 and uh, what you'll see here is the same picture okay but here you'll see that this is obviously changing with time and we took a picture uh, using some type of high-speed camera on the lower image is the same picture but you'll see that all of these are averaged out over a period of time so you can't see these changes occurring instantaneously. And this summarizes nicely what we're going to be doing for a lot of problems. So in, whenever you're faced with the problem, you're going to have to decide whether you want a very high accuracy, but you can see that this flow looks much more complex, or a low accur lower accuracy, but a much simpler flow pattern to solve for. And that's really a dilemma for a lot of people doing research and a lot of people looking at uh, different fluid flows is what type of analysis should you do? Is there something in between here that we could do that we could analyze this better without having to use such a rigorous uh, analysis on this first one or maybe not such a simple analysis as we would have on this second one? We'll also talk about one dimensional flows but it's important for you to know one dimensional flows what is meant by that here's an example of a two dimensional flow a two dimensional flow means it varies in two directions so here you see as we move in the what's noted here as the x direction or I'm sorry the z direction as we go along the z direction let me follow this arrow this arrow is changing its magnitude as we move down the pipe so it depends on Z. 
Let's look at the arrows as we move in the R direction. This one's all the same. This one has changed. They have changed again in the R direction. So this is dependent, since it changes both in the Z and the R directions, it's dependent on both directions. In this particular example, we have pipe flow, where the flow is becoming developed, or it's developing. Then it reaches a point where if we look at the arrows in the Z direction, they're no longer changing. If we look at it in the R direction, they still are changing in the R direction. But since now these arrows only change in the R direction, we can say that velocity is only a function of R here. Another interesting uh, thing to talk about is we've already talked about these in thermodynamics, but what about uh, the equivalent of this in fluid mechanics, and how does this apply? Well, uh, what, what I want to kind of emphasize on this slide is the saturation pressure, the vapor pressure. So, uh, on these terms, how are they applicable to fluid mechanics? Well, let me go to the next slide to describe this. Well, in fluid mechanics, we may have an instance where in a turbine blade or in a pump blade we have flow passing over it. Well that pressure of that flow, okay, let's say at, if let's say it's at room temperature, well the pressure along that blade may drop at some point below 2,340 uh, kilopascals. I'm sorry. 2,340 pascals. If at any point in that blade the pressure drops below this value, what we'll notice is that this fluid would begin to change phase. It would turn into a vapor. And let's say that same fluid moved to another location on the blade and the pressure was higher at that location. It would collapse as a liquid. Well, this is known as cavitation, and it's very destructive to pumps and turbine blades alike. And it's usually gone to a great length to avoid. Now, in fluid mechanics, you should visit this, and you learn how to calculate when cavitation occurs. But I'm introducing it here only as an illustration of how we can use some of our thermodynamic properties that we learned previously, now evident in fluid mechanics. Viscosity is also important. I mentioned that earlier, for example, in the no-slip condition. As something moves through here both air and water, uh, water, we have a drag force that acts on these bodies. Now some, some you'll see these animals here in particular are very streamlined and designed to move through these fluids uh, very uh, smoothly uh, minimizing their drag force. But this drag force is caused by several factors, one of, be one of them being that flow over that body and that no slip condition occurring here, another due to pressure differences between the front and the back of these different animals. Okay, so those are the, that's one impact of viscosity in, in practical application. Now for our case, we're going to be dealing with Newtonian fluids. Newtonian fluids represent things like water and air, or most specifically, it's something that the uh, rate of deformation is proportional to the shear stress. In other words, this right here. The shear stress that's occurring in the body is equal to this viscosity term, okay, we call this viscosity, times the velocity gradient, okay? And this velocity gradient was described here, so the change in U, the change in velocity with respect to the change in height here. So depending on how steep that um, velocity gradient is or how viscous our fluid is, so the more viscous a fluid, so if we have syrup or honey, this is much higher number than if we have another fluid. And we can calculate the force acting on the body by multiplying this shear stress by an area.
Okay, and here this gives you an idea. Uh, we have the uh, viscosity of, uh, of uh, something uh, we can express in many different ways. Kilogram per meter second, Pascal second, one poise, uh, centipoise, many different ways we can describe these different things. So here's it again expressed uh, where we have shear stress plotted against the velocity gradient and that slope would give us our viscosity. We have other things like non-Newtonian fluids but we're not going to talk about those. Non-Newtonian fluids would be like blood, toothpaste, uh, different things like that but we, we could save that discussion for later. So this velocity here, this mu term, is called kinematic viscosity. I'm sorry, <laughs> dynamic viscosity. If we divide it by density, we would obtain the kinematic viscosity, which has units of meter squared per second. And both are useful to use. Sometimes we express it in this term because it is a combination of these two values together. Or uh, if we want to express something that... Um, uh, especially for gases where the dynamic viscosity um, is uh, changing or not changing and uh, we, we want to uh, we want to look at it in terms of uh, the dependence on pressure or temperature so uh, there's your introduction to uh, some of the topics we'll be covering, some nomenclature we'll have. I'll work some example problems here in the next slide. Then we'll get into talking about some fluid statics.